Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Thinking Leader. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a second, this guy does not sound nearly American enough to be Bryce, and he certainly does not sound intelligent enough to be Marcus. Who is this mere pretender? Well, I'm James and you have probably, well, you wouldn't have heard of me uh, on this podcast, but you've definitely heard and hopefully enjoyed my work because I'm actually the executive producer of this here podcast. So it's me and my team who make all of this audio and video magic happen on a consistent basis. Unfortunately, Marcus is MIA. He is a uh, moving house. He's relocating to sunnier shores. And as he wasn't available, I decided um, to hijack this little podcast and jump into the hot seat because me and my team very much enjoy listening to these shows and um, my team like it a little bit too much to be honest i think they're going to go and <laughs> start a, a breakaway company off the knowledge that they've got from listening to this podcast so it might be uh it might be my downfall working on this show but over the episodes that we've produced there's been some amazing concepts that have been discussed but i wanted to break it down as a as a listener a genuine intrigued listener of this show now and the producer of it I can sometimes get a bit lost about what red team thinking is. And I wanted to know, taking it back right back to basics, how did this concept even get invented in the first place? How did you guys come up with this? And and what is red team thinking? It's quite a grandiose, overarching statement, but I guess the episode title of this would be something along the lines of what is red team thinking? Break it down for those of us who are not as intelligent as your usual listener, if you would, Mr. Hoffman. Well, I, first of all, it's so great to have you on the show, James, because as you said, you and your team are, are the magic behind making the Thinking Leader podcast happen. What is red team thinking? Well, red team thinking is, is simply put, is a cognitive capability that is designed to engage critical thinking, enable distributed decision making, and encourage diversity of thought. And doing these things helps leaders and the organizations they lead make better decisions faster in the complex world that we all live in today. It's really a way for leaders to know what they don't know and to create plans that are resilient, plans with optionality so that they can deal with the uncertainties that every day seems to throw at us. How did you come across this? Because I, I know a bit about your backstory. I've seen some um, very questionable fashion choices from the 90s when you were a very successful journalist <laughs> interviewing various sort of business. <laughs> they were questionable fashion choices in the 1990s, I assure at you. At the time, I'm sure you were at the cutting edge of fashion, but retrospectively, looking back in time, it was questionable uh, with, with history on our side. But how did you get to sort of, I, I know from your um, sort of your top end workings in journalism, you got to be around some of the I mean, literally some of the biggest corporate leaders that have ever walked the planet. You've And you've interviewed a lot of them on this podcast. But how did you go from journalists digging for the gold within other people to going, actually, here's a system and a process that could work for a lot of critical thinking for other top leaders? The zombie movie. <laughs> We're, very good zombie movie. Which one was it? I'm, I'm World you, War Z <laughs> or World War Z, as, as, as you would as say. As we would call it, yeah. Are you familiar with it? I am, yes. So I got I to gotta preface this, James, by saying that I'm not a fan of zombie movies generally, and I'm not a fan of horror movies in general. But when, when World War Z or World War Z came out, which I think was around 20, 2013 timeframe, we, we'll, we'll, we'll put the actual date in the show notes. Um, several friends of mine whose opinions I valued told me, you got to see this. It's the thinking man zombie movie. Now that seemed like an oxymoron to me. And while <laughs> I valued their opinion, I didn't value it enough to actually go to the theater and watch the movie. But 
a few months later, it popped up on as a new release on, on my streaming service. And I was homesick one day. And I said, well, there's, there's worse ways to kill an afternoon. So I, I started watching it. And as you know, from because you saw the movie, uh, you know, typical zombie apocalypse story. You know, there's a, a, a zombie plague starts in India and spreads rapidly around the world and, you know, destroys every country in the world except Israel. Israel is the only country that's still left standing, at least at an early point in the movie. And so our hero, Brad Pitt, is sent by what's left of the U.S. government, which at the time is operating off of, you know, a, an aircraft carrier off the east coast of, of what used to be the United States, to Israel to find out why, what did they know that no one else knew? Why did they, why were they the only country in the world that dodged this bullet? And he lands and in, in Jerusalem and he's, he's picked up at the airport by a, a leader of Israeli intelligence. And he asks him that question. And, and what the guy says is, is, and we'll put a clip of this in the notes because there's a great clip of this. He says, he explains to Brad Pitt that they have something called the 10th man concept and the 10th or 10th man doctrine. And the 10th man doctrine is something he explains that they came up with during, after the, the 1973 Yom Kippur war, which they almost lost. And they almost lost it, he explains, because, because they didn't challenge their own thinking their own assumptions. And so to make sure that never happened again, they created something called the 10th man doctrine. And the 10th man doctrine is real simple. He explains, if all of us on the Israeli security council, uh, believe something is true, it's the job of the 10th man to argue the opposite is true. And so he says, just like every country in the world, we got this bizarre signals intelligence from India talking about this, this plague and zombies and everything. And just like every country in the world, we were inclined to totally disregard it. But I was the 10th man. And so I said, what if it's true? What if this is really happening? And we sealed our borders. And that's how come the zombies uh, are not in Israel. Well, as you know, from the movie, it doesn't really matter. Five minutes later, the zombies are at the Wailing Wall. But that it mattered a great deal to me because at the time I had just, uh, you know, a year or two before written my first book, American Icon, Alan Mulally and the fight to save Ford Motor Company. And I had quit my job as a journalist in order to teach companies how to implement Alan's management model. And I had one of the things I was struggling with that I had been struggling with, James, since I was a journalist was how, how do you. How do you get people to challenge their assumptions? How do you get people to think the, about the unthinkable? How do you get people to, to overcome complacency? And so when I saw this clip, I, I just was like, this is amazing. Is this true? Is there such a thing as the 10th man doctrine? Because if it is, businesses need this. And my mind started going to all these business cases where you could apply it. I started thinking about, you know, what if there'd been a 10th man at, at Ford or General Motors or Chrysler in the United States in the early 1970s, when the Japanese cars first started coming in, in, in mass to, to, to the U.S. And instead of sitting around the boardroom, you know, smoking their cigars and joking about, you know, how Americans are never going to buy these little tin cans. You know, they want big cars, the V8 engines and stuff. What if somebody had sat at the table and said, fine, but what if they do? What if this is exactly what Americans want? What if they do buy these cars? What are we going to do? How different would the world have been in that scenario? And so when I got better, I did what anyone would do, James. I, I got on the Internet and, and went looking for an Israeli intelligence officer to find out if it was real. <laughs> of all the origin stories for this, this business, this concept, this strategy, this suite of tools and, and tactics – a Brad Pitt film about zombies was not where I expected this to go. <laughs> I'm pleased where it's gone. Don't get me wrong, but it's not where I expected it to go. So, so when you, and, and like I say, does if ten, does the tenth man doctrine actually exist? Well, and so I, I, I went. I, I, it's surprisingly easy to find an Israeli intelligence officer. It turned out online, and so I, I so I, you actually I, did. I, you actually looked for. Oh right, <laughs> yeah. I just went up. I, I, you it's know, better, I. Better. I yeah, no, that's exactly what I did. I went online and I, I, I looked around. I found, I found an Israeli intelligence officer. He just retired. And I, I said, can we talk? And I and, uh, said, sure. And we set up a call and I, I explained to him, I just watched this movie. And he started, he started getting this kind of 
grin on his face. He could tell where this was going. And I said, well, I got to ask you. I said, is it true? Do you, is, there, is the Tenth Man Doctrine real? And I had already thought in my mind, James, I'm already thinking this is my next book here. If this is real, I'm going to I'm going to learn everything I can about this. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to talk to, you know, figure out how to port this to business. So I have a lot hanging on the answer to this question. Right. And he he looks and he kind of nods like this. And he's like, then he shakes his head and he says, no, it's it's we have no idea where they got this 10th man doctrine from. Never heard of the 10th man doctrine. And I'm just crushed. I'm like I'm like devastated, James. But then he says, but. Everything besides the name is real. And he proceeds to tell me it's not called the 10th man doctrine. It's 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 and it's not one person. It's a group. It's a team that exists within Israeli military intelligence called Ipsha Mistabra, which I'm butchering, but it's Aramaic for on the contrary, the opposite may be true. He says it's a, this elite team within our within our directorate of military intelligence who just like the movie says was created after the 1973 Yom Kippur War and still exists to this day. And its job is to take whatever the prevailing thinking of Israeli intelligence is and argue that the opposite is true, to force the organization to challenge its assumptions, to think outside the box, to look at problems in a different light. And he begins to explain to me how the, the beauty of this team is the people who are on this team are not judged. They don't have to be right. They're not judged by how many times they, they make the rest of the organization look bad. They're judged simply by the, the depth of the conversations that they spark within the intelligence agency. And I'm like, this is even better. And so I say, do you think I could come to Israel and, and you know, study with you guys and learn how this works? And he said, well, I could ask. He said, but I don't know why you would bother. He said, the best, the, the, he said, this is just our version of, of red teaming and the best red teaming school in the world is in the United States at, at the Command and General Staff College at, at U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He says, that's where we send people to learn about these tools and techniques. He says, you, you should just go there. So again, I did what anyone would do, James. I, I picked up the phone and called the Pentagon and asked if I could audit their course. <laughs> and uh, and what did they say? They, they let you go and do it? No, they said, who the hell are you? Sure, that's the... <laughs> I said, I said, I am a best-selling author and, and um, I want to write a book on this and a really nice guy. And they said, again, who the hell do you think you are? But who I am, James, is incredibly persistent. So it took <laughs> me six months. I knocked on a lot of doors. I made a lot of phone calls. I sent a lot of emails, but I finally got permission to become the first and only civilian from outside government to go to the U.S. Army's Red Team Leader course and uh, graduate from it and become a, a military certified Red Team Leader. I, and uh, spent the first half of 2015 in beautiful Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which is also, in addition to housing the, the Command and General Staff College is where we have our maximum security prison, you know, for the, for the military. So it's a real garden spot. And, uh, you know, uh, learned all about this and uh, and then figured out how to port it to business. Well, that's a naturally great place to take a little bit of a break. After the break, we'll be coming back and we're going to find out exactly how you do port this to business because the idea and the concept is sound, but getting people to buy into actually employing the services of a team of people or a person to intentionally make them challenge their own thinking. I imagine it's not the easiest concept to sell to those who are in the positions of power. So after the break, we're going to find out exactly how you port these concepts into the real world. Hey folks, Bryce here. If you like what you're hearing on today's episode and you want to learn more about red team thinking, you want to do red team thinking, learn how to use red team thinking as a leader to make better decisions and better navigate today's complex world. I've got a perfect opportunity coming up for you. On September 14th, Marcus and I will be leading a live online course, the Red Team Thinking Bootcamp. You can find out all about it on our website, redteamthinking.com, or click the link in the show notes. This is our introductory course. It's just $100, and it will give you 
a solid foundation in what red team thinking is, where it comes from, how it works, the science and psychology behind red team thinking. And most importantly of all, we will arm you with some basic red team thinking tools that you can start using right away to better navigate your complex world. September 14th, online, worldwide. Check it out. I hope to see you there. So welcome back to this slightly unusual, but very interesting edition of The Thinking Leader, where I, James Burt, usual behind the scenes guy who's producing this podcast, uh, is taking the place of the rather fantastic Marcus because he's not around this week. And I'm getting to dig into actually the origin story, the very unexpected origin story. <laughs> if you've... Uh, well, hopefully you won't pick this up halfway through the podcast. Hopefully you've listened to the first half where uh, Bryce has um, outed himself as thinking that at one point he'd watched a zombie movie and had created a new concept for strategic thinking. Luckily, it actually wasn't a fever dream. It was real. Uh, he had to just do a bit of international espionage-based digging to get to the bottom of it um, and then take this into the real world. So this is the, the, the sort of line of questioning I'd love to go down in part two. Now, you mentioned a few times before that the whole and sole purpose of these teams that you discovered was to look at, well, what if the opposite was true? What would happen then? And as you mentioned before, you know, this the, the idea and the concept of this red team thinking is to question assumptions and to challenge one's own um, long held, I guess, in a lot of cases, opinions right. and, and what you know you believe to be true. So whilst it's a great idea in concept and whilst it's a great idea in theory, how challenging was it to go into businesses where C-suite executives and board directors and people who sit in senior positions, I guess most of the time would like to be perceived as always having the right answers. How challenging was it to go in and say, here's this great theory, here's this great concept, and here's something that's so valuable but I'm literally going to have to come in here and try and prove you guys wrong. How difficult a sell is that uh, at the top ends of business? Well, the beauty of what we do, James, is that I never go in and try to prove people wrong. What we do is we go in and teach people how to do this themselves so they can prove themselves wrong. And that's it. it that makes all the difference in the world. Because, you know, <clears throat> when I when I was writing my book, Red Teaming, I had the opportunity to work with some amazing uh, people and, and amazing leaders in the area of human decision making and cognitive science, and and none more amazing certainly than than Dr. Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in this area. And I was I was having uh, first time I met Daniel Kahneman, we were, we were having breakfast at uh, at a little cafe uh, near NYU where he was teaching at the time. And I tell you, James, if you want to if you want to feel stupid for the rest of the day, have breakfast with a Nobel laureate. Um, <laughs> It's uh, it's the kind of the opposite of coffee, um, but uh, but but generously, uh, 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 Dr. Kiedemann met with me. We were talking this, and I, and I was explaining this concept of red teaming and red team thinking that I was developing based on the military's model and, and the model of intelligence agencies um, around the world. And explaining some of the tools, and I said, you know, what do you think? I said, you know, do you think that this approach would be helpful? Would it help leaders make better decisions? Would it help them overcome cognitive bias and, and, and overcome groupthink? And he said, I could, yes, I could see that, that it would. He said, but you're going to have the same problem that every consultant has. He said, you know, if they don't like what you show them, they're just going to ignore it. They're going to say, well, he doesn't understand our business. He doesn't understand our industry. He doesn't get it. And I said, that's the beauty of this, the Dr. Kahneman is we're never going to do that. That's never going to happen. <laughs> and he, he kind of looked at me over, over his breakfast plate and said, what do you mean that's never going to happen? He says, it happens to me all the time and I have a Nobel prize. <laughs> he said, you don't. Um, and and, and I, I said, because I said, because we're never going to tell them what's wrong or what they're missing or, 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 or what's what they should be thinking about. I said, all we're going to do is give them the tools, teach them these techniques, walk them through this. And they're going to come up with that themselves. So that when they, when they, and he's like, how's that going to work? So I had, I had literally the day before been working with a test client. I was, I was piloting these tools with some of my existing clients. Um, and I was, this was a, this was a company, a pretty iconic company that had done really well in the 20th century and had not 
managed to transition to the 21st century very successfully. And so they brought in a new CEO and they'd come up with, he'd come up with a turnaround plan. And, and I was, I was using <clears throat> red team thinking to, to help them stress test the turnaround plan before they submit it to the board. And, and so I explained to Dr. Kahneman, the way it worked was, you know, I just came in and led them through exercises using these tools. And I, I, I used the tools, but they would be the ones that would provide the answers that would do the thinking. And so I said, you know, for instance, when we were doing this, we, we, we were using this particular tool um, and it's sir, the, the chief marketing officer of the company said, this element of the turnaround strategy is not going to work. I can see that now because of using this tool and this is why it's not going to work. And I said, I, I stopped the, you know, I said, you know, the CEO and, and, and the other senior executives were at the table. And I said, so did everyone hear what she said? Everyone nodded. And I said, does anyone want to push back on what she said? And several of the other executives, including the CEO said, no, she's right. She, this is really something important that she surfaced. And I said, right. So let's all note this here. I didn't tell you this. Your chief marketing officer told you this. You all agreed with her. You all agreed that this is not going to work because of the issue that she just raised. Now you need to figure out how to address that problem. It's not red team thinking that told you this. It's not Bryce Hoffman that told you this. It's your own chief marketing officer. And so when I explained, when I shared that with him, he, he kind of nodded and said, that could work. Which was a ringing endorsement because, you know, for those who have <laughs> never watched Daniel Kahneman... He, he is a very pessimistic guy. You know, my, my favorite, inter he, he, he did a long, hour long, I think, interview with, with Charlie Rose several years ago. And at the end of it, Charlie Rose is, is kind of like the despondent. And his last <laughs> question is, Dr. Kahneman, is there any hope for mankind? And without even pausing, he shakes his head and says, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> This guy sounds fantastic. Not the sort of person that you'd ordinarily want to go for breakfast with, especially if you're trying to validate your concept. I guess that was your own version of red team thinking, right? It there. was. Yeah. Right. No, it In really action. was, James. You're absolutely right, because that's what we teach people to do is seek out people. If you're a leader, you need to seek out people who will challenge your thinking, who will push back, who will who will ask you tough questions because you know, that really that conversation ended up really validating what I was working on because, because it, it made me see that, yes, this is something very different than consulting. And he's right. You could be the smartest consultant in the world. He, he probably is the smartest consultant in the world, but if you tell people things that they don't want to hear, it's so easy to dismiss that. Mm. It's so easy to say, oh, well, he's, he's an academic. He doesn't understand the challenges we're facing. He's not in the trenches with us. But if you come up with these ideas, if you come up with these insights yourself, it's very hard to, to unthink that. It's, it's, that's why we, you know, taking the red pill, like in the matrix, you know, once, you, once you've taken it, it's hard to go back to, 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 to see the world as it was before. Once you start challenging your own thinking, it, 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 it's hard for anyone to say, okay, we're not going to pay any attention to that thing we just saw. We're going to ignore that. We're not going to look at it. We're going to go forward with our stupid plan that we had before. No, most people are going to are going to feel compelled. They're probably going to stay up all night working on a way to address it. How, how do you get, you know, let's say, for example, um, uh, you know, as a sort of a, a case study here, let's just say for the sake of argument, there's a, a turn, exactly in that example, there's a turnaround plan and there's a new CEO has been brought in to turn around. You know, the motor trade is probably a very good place to look at, given that all of the changes in EV and technology and all the rest. Right. Of it. Let's say a new, uh, a new CEO comes on board. Someone else within the organization is like, I don't think this is going to work. I, I, a friend of mine was a very, very high end CEO of 11,000 staff and 1,000 stores in the UK. He ran a company called Thomas Cook, which is a very big travel agency oh, yeah. company. Um, and he was actually the CEO and had to step down because he wanted to make an attempt to buy the company um, because he could see it was going in the wrong direction. Uh, but nobody else wanted to, to see that. No one else on the board. So he's like, he stepped down to try and buy it and they, and they knocked back his offer to, to buy it. But let's say that and then the, look what happened to them. Exactly. Um, but let's say on the opposite side of that, let's say, for example, someone's come in, they've got a plan, but it's not working out. How do you, as uh, sort of in the first meeting, how do you go in and, convince these people against their will almost that red team thinking is going to be a strategy that's going to add 
value. And I appreciate, you know, you're probably speaking to five, 10, 15 members of a board. Some are going to be into it. Some are not. How do you, for those who have, you know, cause your ego's attached to it at this point, your reputation, your professional um, viewpoint, your stature, your status is linked to your ability to do this job. How do you go in and convince people that actually the ability or just the willingness to proactively try to question their own assumptions is the way to go. How on earth do you have that conversation with people that don't want to, to even be thinking that? Well, it's very hard to have that conversation with people who don't want to be thinking that. And, you know, we don't, we really don't try usually because the thing is, is that, you know, it, you, you can't force someone to embrace red team thinking. They have to be, it requires a thinking leader. It requires a leader who knows they can do better, who knows their organization can do better, who wants to challenge their own thinking. And if you've got someone, you know, one of the first lessons we learned at, at Fort Leavenworth when I was there is you can't red team in the Fuhrer bunker. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're an autocratic leader who thinks they have all the answers you know, and and doesn't need anyone to tell you anything that might challenge your thinking, you're never going to be able to embrace these tools and techniques. So there's no point in me trying to sell you on it. But if you're a thinking leader, if you're a leader like I just described, who wants to wants to do better, who knows you can do better, who's always challenging themselves, then the secret is not is not telling them, it's showing them. You have to you have to see this in action. <clears throat> and what I've found in, in, in my work is that as soon as people see what red team thinking is and just get a little taste of it, they just want more and more because they see how powerful it can be. They see what it can do in their organizations. And so the most successful engagements we've had with clients is where we work with the CEO, we work with senior leaders. We come in and we do a short program, like say 90 minutes with them and just give them, you know, here, here's a tool that we can do right now to understand what how this would work. Let's do it a little exercise. They do it. And every time they're like, this is great. We want to roll this out to this part of our organization. We want to roll this out throughout our whole organization, whatever it is. So it's really a matter of, of finding the leaders who can use these tools and then showing them, just giving them a glimpse of how they work. Because, because it's the type of thing that, again, it's like I said about, you know, once you've taken the red pill, you don't want to, you don't want to go back and in, in, into the illusion again. You want to see the world as it actually is. And you want more, you want, you want more clarity, more insights, more ideas. And so that's, that's, that's both the opportunity and the challenge because finding those people is, 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 is the challenge we have. That's why we do the podcast. That's why we do everything we do is to reach those folks out there who are like, yes, I know I can do better. I know my organization could do better. I know my team could do better. I want to arm them with the tools that they need to do better. How do you uh, sort of working towards wrapping this up? Cause I want to be respectful of your time. And also um, I, I just want to go and watch um, uh, world wars world again wars for, the, for, for, the, <laughs> for the second time to try and see if I, I'd never picked out the lessons. I just thought it was a good movie. I was clearly watching it through the different lens than you were, but in terms of, I know the majority of this audience is uh, probably running quite big, substantial companies at this point in time. They've probably got quite big teams. But if you are, say, someone who is a fast growth scale up startup, let's say you've got 15, 20 members of staff. You know, I, I fall into the category of being a small business owner who is looking to upskill my team. Well, I think I accidentally your podcast is upskilling them for me. So thanks for that. You're inadvertently coaching my team every single week to the detriment awesome. as they're going to go and compete with me. I think they're going to go wrong. Nah. Um, but for, for, for those who are running smaller companies who, who might be going, God, this sounds amazing, but I haven't got a C-suite. I haven't got a board of executives. How can someone who is maybe you know, 15, 20, 30 staff, how can they implement red team thinking at the simplest level, at the smallest sort of sizes of business so they can still benefit from the tools and the tactics? They can totally benefit from this. And you don't need, you, you know, you can do this. I mean, I, mean I, I, I do this to make my own personal decisions in life too. You know, it's simply, I'll, I'll give you three ideas. I mean, the, the tools we teach, you know, require more than, more than a few minutes to, to explain, but I'll just give you a few quick ideas. One is just, just identify the assumptions you're making. If you're going to make a decision, drop a list of the assumptions that underlie that decision, because every decision is based on assumptions. 
And then ask yourself, look at that list and say, how, let's be honest with ourselves here. And if you can give that list to someone else and have them do that for you, even better. Someone you trust say, how, how, how likely, honestly, is it that these, all these assumptions are going to prove true? And, and which of these are strong and which of these are weak? And what could we do to take these weak assumptions and either change the plan, change our decisions so that it doesn't rely on these weak assumptions or do things that increase the likelihood that these weak assumptions will actually prove true? That's a simple thing that you can do. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with a small team. And that right there will lead you to make better decisions. I mean, that's that's a much more simplified version of of, of the of what we teach in our in our courses and teach our clients. But it's it's the that approach, and even just doing it at that level will make a positive difference. I guarantee you, in your decision making. Another thing that you can do that's very simple, and again, it's a simplified version of what we teach, is simply ask yourself before you make a decision: If I do this and it fails. Why is it going to fail? And then ask yourself, what could I do to decrease the likelihood that that thing will happen? And this is important, James, because most of us, when we decide to do something, as, as one of my, my, my clients once said, who is an investment banker, when you decide on something, in their case, if you decide on an investment thesis, we're going to invest in this industry or this company. I love how he said, he said, you become pregnant with the deal. You become pregnant with the deal. Think about that. All you're thinking about is, oh, this bundle of joy here that's going to be coming and it's going to be wonderful. And, and you know, you're not thinking about the negative potential downsides of it. You're not thinking about the problems that could occur with the deal. You're in love with it. And it's like, it's like you know, when, when you fall in love with, with, with a woman for the first time, you know, if, it, if, if one of your friends comes up to you and says, hey, you know, did you notice, that, you know, she's really got this problem or, or is annoying in this way. You're like, shut up. Don't tell me that. You know, you don't want to hear it. It's the same thing with your decisions. So force yourself to say, if this decision fails, how could it fail? What would lead to it failing? And then what could I do to, to make sure that doesn't happen? Those are just two simple things. And there's so many more tools in, in the Red Team Thinking Toolkit that are that are get down into analyzing this in this way in a much more detailed way. But that's the approach and anyone can do it. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're a solo entrepreneur or the CEO of one of the largest corporations in the world. We work with both of those people, you know, and, and it works just as effectively at all levels. Amazing stuff. Well, I knew I'd enjoy this podcast episode. I didn't know I would enjoy it quite as much as this. And I definitely didn't know that I was going to get the origin story that I did, but I very much enjoyed it. Um, and again, as a independent small business owner who has got, you know, gone from zero to sort of five staff in the last you know, three months, um, I'm definitely starting to, from the podcast episodes I'm listening to, I'm like, oh, I could do that. Oh, I could do that, actually. Um, so thank you for sharing and breaking down what Red Team Thinking actually is. And for those who are listening, if you're sitting there thinking, hey, I need a little bit of this in my business. My team needs this. Our, sweet seat, our C-suite needs this. Our board of directors needs this. Click the link in the show notes now to find out much more information and um, find out more about the courses, find out more about Red Team in general, because I think you can get huge, huge value from it, um, regardless of the size of your organization or where you're at right now. It seems a bit strange for me to say, Bryce Hoffman, thanks for joining me, because it's sort of, I've kidnapped your own show, so I guess you, sh you should thank <laughs> well, me. Well, thank you but for <laughs> joining me, James. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thanks for letting me hijack your show. Uh, it's been fantastic. Hey, it's been great. Awesome stuff. Thank you very much. And guys and girls, whoever is listening, as I say, click the link in the show notes for more information on anything that is covered. Uh, the links it will be in the show notes, as well as some of the references that we've made uh, to this, including probably a link to where you can watch World War Z as well. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Bryce. Absolutely. And we'll see Cheers. you guys all uh, very soon. Normal service will be resumed when Marcus gets back. You'll be pleased to know that'll be very soon. Thank you for tuning in to The Thinking Leader. Check the show notes for more information about the topics covered in this episode. There, you'll also find a link to our free assessment. Click on it right now to find out if you are a red team thinker.
with a red team culture.